Holy smokes, we, I'm so excited to just jump in here and uh, hold some space for Mike before he gets here, because his stuff's always really interesting and useful. And this is something that I have, meth labs are something that I have been excited about teaching about for at least 15 years. And so it's a neat thing for me to, to share about. I've been a home inspector for 15 years. So before licensing even came into play in Maryland, I ran a franchise with my dad. And when he retired, I started out with another company. And um, there are not a lot of meth labs in Maryland. And I know not everyone on here is in Maryland. So I know some of you are in Virginia and we've got people in other areas. So you may have heard more or learned more or seen some of these things. And some of these things you may see and go, what the heck? I didn't know that's what that was. It's just super important to keep in mind that it's taking everything into, into account, not just looking at one thing and making, making a, a call. Uh, Sean was saying, you know, I haven't seen orange stained stuff. And if you saw orange stained stuff, it might not mean it's a meth lab. There are other things to look for. So that's what we're going to get into. Any questions before we get started? Okay, so I'm gonna count on you. This this is a great class for conversation because you'll have questions as we go. So please put them in the chat. And then uh, Sean or Hollis, I think, is, is making sure that I, I get whatever is there that I need to hear. We're gonna talk about the scope of the meth lab problem, um, drug culture vocabulary, how labs impact the community, at some signs and cleanup protocol. My goal with this is just to have you recognize what's there and what the signs are so that when, if you come across them, you know what we're looking at. So um, hopefully you never do. And where I've seen it has been in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. Those are the places where I've found it in, in homes. So you just never know. Um, that is the county with Annapolis in it. So it's a it's a pretty wealthy county. So some of the nicknames for methamphetamines or crystal meth is crystal, peanut butter, crank, glass, ice, speed, makes it all feel sound fantastic. The point of methamphetamines and crystal meth is to keep you awake. So it was used during World War II to keep people awake. The, uh, the um, Japanese, the kamikaze pilots, had meth before they flew their last flights. The German army, the Nazis, all were using what was, at the time it was called pervitin, not meth, but pervitin, and it kept them awake. One of the great things about, um, and I say great with air quotes, the great things about uh, pervitin was that it kept you awake and it also minimized your appetite, almost took it away completely. So you didn't have to eat, didn't have to sleep. What could be better for people fighting a war? Um, this is an old ad about um, picking up the scabs that you get from meth. We've probably seen people who've used meth and they've got the scabs and sores on them. That's just what this guy on the on the bed is doing, picking at what he thinks is bugs under his skin. So clearly, you don't want your soldiers and your pilots um, picking at their skin and getting all of the side effects of not eating and not sleeping. I don't know about you, but I get hangry and tired. And that's what these these soldiers did. And that's why they're thinking actually the they were like on a the sold the German soldiers were on a long bender and right they lost in France, they lost the war. And the thought is that that's because they stopped the pervitin stopped working for them. Because over time you build up resistance to it. Like sometimes you need more than two cups of coffee. You sometimes need a third cup. Your body just builds up resistance. This book, Blitzed, is just a really cool book all about the drug use of in the Third Reich. So then people came back from the war and they found, and I apologize for the sound of the dogs barking in the background. They love the story too. Um, the, they came back from the war and they couldn't get meth. They were given some, um, so yes, Sorry, the Japanese government was giving out pervitin, the Germans, the British, and then the United States. Then they realized it might be a problem and they stopped distributing it. Well then and people were addicted. So then they had to they had to start making their own. 
it was used in the United States, the same chemical compounds that are in methamphetamines used to make um, inhalers and allergy medicine. And ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are what are used to make an allergy medicine now. And that's um, so that's still going on. It's not the same thing, but it is a component of meth, uh, the ephedrine is. And so that's why you have to stand in line in Maryland at the pharmacy and show your driver's license to be able to get stuff that's behind the counter, the allergy medicine with a D on the end, the Claritin D, uh, all those types of things. Uh, let's see. Okay. So they came back from the war. They did not have any meth, and so they made it on their own. And then it just went around the country. It started out on the West Coast and then moved across the country. Uh, drugs are very addictive, from caffeine to nicotine to meth, just addictive. And making meth became super simple once the internet was really available. And <laughs> I should have, I've got these two slides reversed, so sorry. But in 1985, Uncle Fester in Wisconsin wrote a book all about how to make meth, four different recipes for it with stuff that you've got around the house. And once that happened, it pretty much revolutionized what was available for people because then they knew how to make it. So it was motorcycle gangs is how they describe them now, who made it and sold it on the West Coast. And then people in the Midwest started taking it because they couldn't get to other drugs. You can make it anywhere. It's very, very flexible. You can do it in your car, you can make it outside, and you make it with stuff in the house. These are just some of the links that I found. Um, you go to YouTube, how to make meth, and there's a ton of information. Uh, neither Mac Ashy nor I, nor anybody I work with, recommends the use of meth. It's illegal, and we don't recommend that you take meth or go anywhere dangerous to learn more about meth. <clears throat> This is a meth pipe, and meth in its the traditional form, the way you most likely see it. And so you'd smoke it using the, not you, someone, users would smoke it using this pipe. So if you see those, and they're in the house, and there is a central air system, so you've got forced air going through ductwork, then all it takes is smoking it in the house a couple of times and the whole house is contaminated wherever that HVAC is sending it. So you smoke it in the living room and you've got air going through the whole house, it's throughout the whole house. And we'll get into that more, but that's why I'm showing you what it looks like. People also inject it, smoke it, snort it. It's a very versatile drug. People can make it at home and then use it. And it became really popular in the Midwest because they didn't have access to the big cities where they could buy different designer drugs, so to speak. So they used what they could to make it and then they were able to get high. It became a great thing that um, soccer moms liked in the Midwest because it allowed them to keep up with their kids. Gave them lots of energy, a feeling of euphoria, and they didn't have to eat, so they got as thin as they wanted to. We're going to get into that in a little bit, but um, that was where it became a problem, like a crossover drug that was just people who had never considered doing meth will just take a little bit of this, and then they're good to go for a couple of days. It's a, it's remarkable the number of people who got into it, and then how many lives it destroyed. So this is a one pot cooking method of uh, of crystal meth. And so this was someone just cooked this on a hot plate and this is what's what it looks like. So if you were to come across this in a kitchen and see it on a on a stovetop or on a hot plate in the bathroom or on the back of the toilet is like the best place to cook in a bathroom. So the you would have if you saw this, you would just want to leave and then call the police and tell them what you found. 
that's the, the next step. But if you see this, just get out of there. Why does any of this matter? That's what realtors ask me when I teach it for them for continuing ed. That's what you might be wondering. So I've taught you the history of meth, really. How does that impact you? During manufacture and smoking of meth, the chemicals become airborne or volatized and they are throughout the house. The most common place for the highest level of concentration is on the ceiling, but it's on the walls, it's on the appliances, it's on the furniture, the toys, whatever's there. So anytime you might touch, touch a surface, and I mean, we're doing home inspections, we're touching everything. When you're touching anything, you are exposed to those chemicals. And there are two, they kind of break down the side effects into two parts, acute and chronic. The acute is like what is happening now, and that is um, headache, dizziness, um, loss of memory. And my loss of memory comes from having had COVID about three weeks ago. And so my brain, I still have some fog. But those are the types of things that nausea that you would experience. There was a house in Pasadena that some agents were, some real estate agents in the area were listing. They went to the house and were with the um, the seller who was an older woman, and I say older, she was 75 and she was getting ready to move down to Florida to be with her daughter because she had been experiencing signs of dementia and so she couldn't live on her own anymore. So these two agents were going together well, very frequently to help her clean out her house and get things kind of set up for her to be able to move and put the house on the market. And so they they noticed that as they left, they always had a, a really bad headache, some dizziness and felt nauseous. And what they realized was next door, there was a house for sale. And so they just kind of looked at the, ha at the house. The house wasn't listed on the MLS. It had a sign in the front, but the people who said whose sign it was weren't actually listing it. So they went, they thought, well, this is weird. They hadn't put these health effects together with this house next door, but they went next door and they walked around the house and had rain barrels at each corner of the basement or of, of the house, front and back. And then they had blocked off all the windows with brick. So the, win the house was brick, windows were brick in the basement. And these two agents walked around and one of them tripped. And as she tripped, she caught herself leaning on the, um, on the rain barrel and when she did it tipped up there was nothing in it there was no bottom to it they were discharging the the fumes the all of the leftover nasty air from the basement into the rain barrels and up so it looked like downspouts coming down from the gutters into the rain the rain barrels but it wasn't it was actually coming up and out so it, all the chemicals that were left over, the residue, everything from cooking in that basement was actually just going out into the air and enough was accumulating in the lady's house that was right next door that the two agents were sick every time they were there. Fast forward, lady moves to, the police have handled this at this point now, currently in 2021. But fast forward, the lady has now moved to Florida to live with her daughter, has no signs of dementia and is totally fine. So we're assuming that it has to do that her health and safety are all back and her, her wits are with her now because of her um, getting away from that house. And the agents have not experienced those side effects again. But the agents had no idea what to even think it was until they took my class and then we talked about it and they went, oh my gosh, that really was, that really was what that was. Because they had talked to the police and the police told them some stuff, but they weren't really clear on how it works. They're not sure about the long-term term damage from exposure to meth because there just isn't a lot of data. I know, Jeffrey, isn't it amazing? It's remarkable. This, I just love, that's why it's so incredible to learn because we're exposed to this. We're exposed to the information and it's our responsibility to share it and just keep our eyes peeled. So the agents had the issue. They learned about this 
And it's been how I have found other meth labs in Maryland to actually test, is from agents learning about it from here, from my, my class. We don't know how it lasts long term. We're thinking it's somewhat like lead in the system, the way lead impacts you um, in a developing child. But it doesn't, your body doesn't treat it like lead, doesn't suck it into the bones. So it's, it's different the way the body handles it. It's the closest thing we can compare it to, though. Now for the fun stuff. Some of the things that you're going to see, you may recognize, you may have seen parts of before and never known what it was. So here we are. In detecting a meth lab, I said this earlier. I will probably repeat it a couple of times later. The key to recognizing a meth lab takes into account the totality of the circumstances. It's everything there. It's not just the one thing that you see. So that's why a thorough investigation has to be done. If you see lots of lots of clues, then other steps might be taken. You might see lots of clues and then say, okay, I'm going to test for, for meth. And we can get into that a little bit more, but why wait? I'll talk to you now about it. To test for meth, you can you can do it with a lab and you can do it with, um, there are companies that you can just buy the kits. Um, I have done it with EMSL out of New Jersey and they, and I know they're not the, the cheapest ones, but they've been the most helpful in making sure I'm getting what I need. Um, and that's not an advertisement for them. I use other labs for other stuff. So um, what what they have is a thing that tests for all different chemical res or drug residues. For, so crack cocaine, meth, PCP, and I think two other ones, and I can't remember what they are, but you get all of those together. It probably costs, I want to say we charge 200 or 225. I can't remember what the cost is. It's not as much as you would think. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple to, to just add on for someone. Um, and where you would test if you, saw some some clues and it was act, clearly not active there were not people living there people there all the time ways you might test oh, i'm going to tell you this one too this house that i did i do not have a million stories so i promise this i will not keep interrupting myself but there's a um a house that i went to a woman took my class an agent did and she went to a house in saverna park maryland and she went in and she thought oh my gosh it smells like cat urine, ammonia, chemicals. That's what Rachel said. This is going. This is what meth labs smell like. I bet it's a meth lab. So she called me, and so I thought, well, you know, I said not to take, not to call me with one thing. Like it's a bunch of things. So like, don't freak out. It's okay. It's just one thing. So I get there three days after she called, and the bank that owned it came in in those during those three days, removed the drywall. And what drywall they left, they slapped paint all over. So it was all cleaned up. So when I got there, it smelled like fresh paint, not like cat urine. So I then started looking around the house. The first place I started was the outside looking for what might be on the grass, in the yard, on the driveway, on the porch, those places. So staining on the porch, staining on the patio in the back, dead plants, dead, dead areas of of grass because for every pound of crystal meth that's made there's between five and seven pounds of toxic waste that has to be dealt with isn't that incredible yeah so with those all that toxic waste has to go somewhere the yard is a great place for it the other place and and then they put cat litter on top of it like you won't notice that i guess it absorbs the some of it um the other place would be if you're cooking in a house down the toilet, right? So, or down the sink, in the kitchen down the sink, down the bathtub drain. So there was actually, if you were doing a sewer scope in a house that had been had had a lot of, had had a meth lab in it, so lots of the toxic waste dumped, you would actually see etchings on the inside of some of the pipes. It's pretty remarkable how damaging and corrosive this this is. And it makes sense when you think about what it takes to make them. So here are some of the red flags, and which kind of jump around because this is all, they're all over the place with all the information. Um, 
And there we go. Reminder that the sign in token is meth, M E T H, as in meth lab. There's a bet about what the sign out token is going to be. Pretty sure Jeffrey's going to be right. All right. Uh, we've got chemical odors. That's what I was talking about with the smell of urine and chemicals stained or burned countertops, floors, sinks, on the on the floors, sinks and stoves, there will be burning and staining. Also tape up or black out the windows so that people can't see in. They're very, very paranoid. Remember, they haven't eaten, who knows how long, and they haven't been sleeping. And they're cooking meth. This addiction is so strong that people just can't break away from it and they just use it until they literally can't use anymore and they collapse and what happens is inside the brain the <clears throat> excuse me inside the brain the dopamine centers begin to down regulate so they begin to make less dopamine which is the feel-good chemical that you get from caffeine or chocolate cake or sex and you have this down regulating of the dopamine centers, regulators in your brain, because you're getting so much, you're flooded with dopamine because of this drug, it gives you the sense of well being. So once you take away the drug, you have even lower levels of dopamine. So it's like trying to crawl out of a black hole. The desperation and sadness is just overwhelming. People just, a lot of people can't get past that. And what, what happens is over time, those dopamine receptors actually regenerate. But until that happens, people are pretty desperate. So these are some of the things that you'll see. You've had time to read that while I've been talking. Here's a meth lab in a kitchen. Just some random stuff. You might see it and say, and well, now you'll think it's a meth lab, but you might have at other times thought there was a chemical, a chemistry student there or something. In the front, you see the pot right there, just like the one that I showed you. That's called one pot meth one pot cook if you can do it in one one pot here are some other precursor chemicals these are the things that it takes to make meth and so some of them are um how long does it take using meth to just fall to the floor if you're using it non-stop it depends on how long you've been using it over how what long period of time years or or weeks, but it could be four or five, six days before the body just gives out. So some of the precursor chemicals, and I'm answering the questions as they come up because I feel like they're just quick bullets that I can just throw in there and I wanna make sure that your questions are fully answered. Some of the precursor chemicals that you use to make meth, and you'll see these, these are just all referred to as precursors, every one of these things that it takes to make it. The big thing is the ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. So you can see, and you can see that there with the pseudofed and you see Claritin D, Allegra D, all those kinds of things. The D on the end indicates that it's, you're gonna be getting it from behind the counter at the pharmacy and it's got, um, it's got the chemicals that they need to make meth. It was not, what's happening in the United States is it became cheaper to get once they started putting the drugs behind the, uh, the ephedrine behind the pharmacy counter, it became cheaper and easier to buy meth from Mexico and distribute it here. So it started, homemade meth started to kind of diminish a little bit. And just in the past couple of years, it's been coming back. It's, um, it's a stimulant, it wakes you up, it keeps you going. And it's the opposite of what heroin does and opioids do. So a lot of people, when they do meth, they might smoke a little bit of marijuana to balance out the, the crazy feeling, like they got something funky with the meth and they just, that brings them down a little bit. But a lot of people also do meth and heroin at the same time so that they stay balanced out because the heroin brings you down, down, down. In Maryland, what is usually used as the other half of the balancing act of two drugs is um, crack cocaine. So in Baltimore City, if you're finding heroin, you're finding crack cocaine. And the concern is that meth will take over for crack cocaine again. Like there will become just a, a flip-flop to, to meth. Who knows? But that is where the, the thought lies with a lot of people. Um, 
so uh sorry about the dogs again but then they're roughhousing and i can't stop them but my husband's got them so i apologize so um what else is in there oh red phosphorus that's the other thing so sean was talking about red phosphorus look seeing red staining on bowls that kind of thing where that comes from that phosphorus is coming from the match heads so that you buy a ton of matches has everybody anybody seen breaking bad of course i have no way to tell with breaking bad in the first episode you actually they walk into a house with a lab in the living room and that shows you exactly what i'm talking about here then they have matchbooks with the uh, i'm sorry with the phosphorus strike plates torn off and that's what they're using i said the match heads that's not what i meant the strike plates on the back is where they get the phosphorus and they need that to make mess let's see thank you rico for having watched breaking bad i hadn't watched it and finally everyone's like you teach this class you have to watch it and i did i thought it was fantastic my husband absolutely hated it so i got to watch the whole thing by myself very fast okay so now we have these are some other precursors here rock salt toluene acetone alcohol all the stuff that you think of like this is not like who puts this in their body you know there's some places in eastern europe where they couldn't get these items to make uh to make meth so they started making this other drug called crocodile crocodile and they would inject it and it would kill whatever it touched so it was the people died from this crocodile because they'd have to have their their limbs amputated and they just did it at home just terrible so anyway meth is not good and most drugs are not good also these are just some of the things you'll see around houses and there's other red stained coffee filters here's some other leftovers from a house uh, where someone was making meth which leads me back to my story in Severna Park where I saw I was walking around the outside of the house and I saw there was no dead grass nothing to worry about and I thought this agent might have been a little just excited because she smelled cat urine and there were no cats around and I didn't really think it was a meth lab everything was freshly painted into the laundry room I went and there were dozens of cans of paint thinner dozens of them and they were all corroded on the outside rusty looking that's a great sign that that was a meth lab once I saw those and hang on there's another picture of some plumbing and when you when I, and then I see something like this you know something's been going on in that basement so this was happening and there were all these different um all these cans of paint thinner and this person was clearly not a painter so <laughs> what was going on so with the, with that um i then decided to test i told you you can send it to a lab <clears throat> bless you i told you also that you, you choose a lab or do it yourself you test like you're testing for um for lead with with a wipe so you take the wipe and you rub it's a residue that you're rubbing off so you're rubbing in well it was just freshly painted where are you going to test air supply you're going to do check in the ductwork and wipe a good chunk of the residue out of there you may not see it but it and you may in this house i could see something that was a little bit sticky and then you're also you're doing the yep inside the ductwork you win the uh, you wipe there, but the other place that most people don't paint is, and in this case, the ceiling had been painted, but in a house, in most houses, you're not going to find that they painted the ceiling unless they really have to in this situation. So you would test, wipe the ceiling then. If not there, so I did there in the, in the ductwork, and I also did the underside of the mantelpiece in the, of the fireplace because that seemed to be the concentrated area of where the agent had smelled the cat urine and where they had done a lot of painting. And then the tops of the door jams, or the door frame, they're not, they don't paint there. So I wiped up there too. And then it turned out that yes, it had indeed been 
likely a meth lab. There was enough, uh, and basically when you test it, you find out, even if you know it was a meth lab, what you want to find out is how much there is so that you know what steps next need to be taken for, for cleaning it up. Um, great question, Joe. Have I experienced or know of anyone who has falsely identified a house as a meth lab? It's, so what might those repercussions be? Great question. I have not experienced it, and I've also never identified something as a meth lab um, without testing just like I would never call something mold without actually testing, potential fungal growth or whatever. And this is, there are some signs of that and it's a delicate conversation to have. It's not something where you just go, hey, bet they were cooking meth in here, you should probably test. It's not, you really do have to delicately talk about it. And maybe that's why I haven't experienced it. I don't know, Joe, but that's a fantastic question. And if you wanna talk about how you might talk about it with a client, feel free to call me um, or text me or email or something and we'll, we can figure something out. Because I've also had people buying houses who just say, I just want to test for meth. Well, did you see anything? Did you smell anything? No, I just know that this area has a drug problem and I want to know what's going on in this house. All you have to do is smoke it in there once or twice and the house is contaminated if you've got that air going. So that's kind of depends. I told you meth labs could be anywhere. Here are a couple. What I, I also mentioned something about the one pot meth, meth labs. Those are um, great for meth cookers because they can make them um, anywhere. In They can make it in a hotel on the counter. They can make it in the coffee pot at the hotel. Um, these are a couple places where they found it uh, a hotel in Vegas and this hotel in um, at 103 and 100 in Elkridge in Maryland. Um, but you can make it anywhere. And what happens is people will make it in their laps. And they'll, and so I'm going to show you those in a minute. But one pot lab, um, meth labs can be made in two liter bottles or 20 ounce water bottles or soda bottles. And you, you if you're making it in your car, just hold it in your lap. Well, if it explodes, you're going to have a problem. But we're not going to have, you know, a lot more meth makers around because, hello, that's a, some serious damage happening there. Um, and you might see this if you see this in a in a bathtub, you've got an area where these are these have been used for making meth, one pot meth, or shake and bake, or I call it fragrance free version because it doesn't smell as strongly as the cat urine because it's kind of contained in the bottles, but it's really crucial when they're making it, they've got a, the, the it, you should Google this and just look at the pictures because the bottles are expanded because there's so much pressure built up inside them and they're flammable like crazy. So that's, that's an issue. So it's something else you're looking for. Um, thank you, Sean, for send, putting out my email address there. Um, and my cell is, um, you've got that, Sean, don't you? It's at the bottom of my email. Um, yeah, I'll find it. Okay. Um, how long does it take a mat? A, a, how long does it take to make a batch? Good question, Bruce. This is who lives in the state of confusion. It's fantastic. So we are um, looking at this. This shake and bake one pot is faster to make than they would make on uh, if you're making it on the kitchen counter with all sort making a big batch of it. You'd be using making it like this more for personal use to get you through because there's no place to buy it. So this is quick. I can't tell you how fast, but it's not days long. You might start this in the morning and have it in the afternoon. And I'm not exactly sure, but you've given me something more to research. My husband says, oh my gosh, if anyone ever looks at our um, history on the web, we are in huge trouble. The DEA is ever looking. We've got other issues, I'm sure. Okay, this hotel here on the left, the one in Elkridge, Maryland, was um, there were two guys who came through looking for drugs in Maryland. This was several years ago. Came through, couldn't find the drugs they wanted, so they decided to make meth in their hotel room. Some other um, hotel guests smelled something strange and called the police. 
and everyone was evacuated. And everywhere that the airflow went, any place that was connected through the same HVAC system had to be completely decontaminated. And what that looks like is removing everything that's porous or things that you're going to be touching frequently. So the bedspreads, the mattresses, um, drywall, they've found, they have ways to clean it. And so, so there are some companies that do clean the drywall and some that don't. So there are different ways to do that. But if you've got um, acoustic tiles on the ceiling, anything that's porous is absorbing the re the residue. So that's something to be thinking of. So that place had to be, had to be, decontaminated in certain areas and they're doing a full renovation right now or they've fully renovated it in the last couple of years so a lot of people when i teach the class in maryland say oh my gosh and now it's totally different i wonder if it's related i have no idea what i do know is the fact is they found people cooking meth there and they stopped it there was also a thing in um arkansas that was several years ago that had had the hotel stop putting coffee pots into the uh, into the hotel rooms because people were using them to cook meth, and that's why they switched to Keurigs because they were using that hot plate. Um, holy smokes, these are great questions. Um, I heard if we were to find ourselves in a meth house and the police came, we'd be required to strip and be decontaminated. Anything we carried or wore would be confiscated. I have not heard that that is true. So I don't, I have not heard that that is actually accurate, but I've also heard it as an urban legend. So I don't know. And I will find out while I'm and let you know. Um, and if you open the door and look in and see something funky, it's not gonna be, it's not, and you don't go in, it's not gonna be an issue. If you're in there and there's an active lab, it is possible that you might need to be decontaminated. I don't know the half-life of the residue, it is it affects people as long as it's there i don't know how long it actually takes to no longer be uh, have an impact on people here's a um a house that was destroyed by a meth lab explosion we've had a lot of explosions in baltimore city over the last couple of years um even the baltimore sun came to me do you think it was a meth lab so uh, yeah, no, no, no naked home inspections. You would stop the home inspection, Bruce. I've got to stop looking at this. It's too much fun. Okay. Um, yes, if they strip you and decontaminate you, you've got other things to think about. You're not likely to find an active lab. You may find some of these leftovers. So that's why I'm showing them to you. Um, and, I, and I'll do a little more exploring uh, to find out what, what you might need to know about that. Um, and I'll put it in the chat next month. Okay, so this house, I mean, this house blew up. Baltimore City, those don't look like they were meth labs that caused explosions. A lot of them were gas leaks. This is a funky picture, but I wanted to put it in here just to show you a little bit of the impact. Then I'm gonna show you a little bit more. One of the biggest dangers of these houses is the people. So it's not just the chemicals that you may come across, but it's also the people that you may encounter while you're there. So this guy, this is his first arrest record picture at age 23. And then in his, he's 25 in the number two picture, which is up in the right hand corner. And then in the middle, there he is, still 25, but more time has passed. So I told you you're not sleeping, you're not eating, you're you're losing a lot of weight. Over time, what happens is you're so malnourished that your body starts starts using the muscle for energy. And so you lose a lot of the musculature and fat that's in your face. So you start to just look really gaunt and get aged really quickly. Has anybody heard of meth mouth? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Frank has taken part in some other meth lab awareness courses and have found that not been notified that there was any way they have to participate. It may be different by each jurisdiction too, depending on what their exposure is. I've taught this for police who had no idea what they were looking at. So that's, it's a, you just never know what people have. 
um, their experience. So meth mouth, teeth damaged. Um, the teeth are really damaged because your saliva production is diminished. As the saliva production decreases, you've got less to protect your teeth and keep your teeth clean naturally, at least a little bit. You also crave sugary sodas, sugary drinks. So you're drinking sugary stuff. You are having all that corrosive stuff. You're having acetone and battery acid and ammonia, all that on your teeth. That's wearing them down. And the blood vessels in your gums shrink. So there's less blood even going to your teeth. So it's it's all just, it's like a nightmare for your for your mouth, what's happening there. And most of the people who are at this point really would rather be dead than dealing with this. And because they can't get away from it and they feel terrible. They can never get like that first high and they've been searching for it all along. Here's a fellow who was working. And so what I'm trying to impress upon you is how desperate people are. And if you come into their house and there's a, a meth lab or there what well, looks like people have been cooking meth there or the bottles, so they're doing the one pot meth, they may they may still be there. And if they are, they're going to freak out because you're in their space. They're gonna be paranoid. A lot of them have weapons. The guys at the um, hotel in Elk Ridge had guns and money and meth. And um, so they're gonna be trying to protect their protect their drug because they don't know how to feel normal without it. So they're going to be really paranoid. Uh, this guy was cooking meth and got burned. And he wanted this picture to be shared with as many people as possible so we could see how how scarred he got from this explosion. I mean, heat, fire, battery acid, ammonia, what could go wrong? This woman on the far left, it's she's the same person all the way across, but on the far left, it's her first arrest record picture. The second one is after the explosion, she was in jail, but she had to deal with all of the um, skin grafting and stuff. So that's after getting out of jail and having the skin grafting um, so that her face could be repaired and workable. The next one is another arrest record after she'd had lots of reconstructive surgery and her last arrest record on the far right. All arrests for cooking meth. She can't stop. These folks are desperate. You may also see big bags of trash outside in the yard, front and backyard, um, house not well taken care of, little kids running around. All of those things would have you kind of stepping closer to your truck rather than closer to the house um, uh, for the home inspection. But those are just some things that you're just paying attention to. Why are these windows blacked out? Also, uh, drug manufacturers, um, if they're making meth in the house and then they decide to leave, they're different from regular home buyers, owners, renters. They don't send change of address cards. So their traditional buyers may come back look to the house looking to buy more drugs and be disappointed and desperate when you open the door or they come in and find you there. Another thought to just have. These are first arrest records and three months apart and two and a half years apart uh, first and next arrest records. These ones show you um, the first arrest record and then the most recent one or the next one um, so that you can see it. Um, and it's giving, so you can get a sense of what it's doing to people. No pictures of meth mouth in here. Just leave that to your imagination. No SPDS. What is that, Bruce? And Frank, thank you, Frank, for your info in Illinois. I used to live in Harvard, Illinois. I don't know if that's near you, but that's where I used to be. Oh, no seller disclosure. Got it. Yeah, seller disclosure conversations happen a lot when I teach this class because people want to know, um, agents want to know how to handle it. And, and that is obviously outside the scope of a home inspector's responsibility or even um, we don't go there with the clients, just know, and you know, we get the information from the seller about what 
what's going on that the the agent has said i don't know there's a crack in the foundation or something and we know that but with this there's some discussion about it because what happens with the disclosure if you come in and you actually buy the house and renovate it remove all the drywall and replace all the ductwork and replace all the carpet and repaint everything with an oil-based paint and then start over and is that okay or do you still need to disclose it well if you have a hole in the roof and you fix it do you have to disclose that at some point you had a hole in the roof so what i do when i'm teaching this class for agents is have them take the conversation a little bit here because generally there are two sides and most of the time neither one is necessarily right it's it really has a lot to do with how the broker handles it and how things happen in that state and county so just that's something that you you can't say this is something that you would disclose or not disclose but it is a it is a real question buyers moving in want to know if they're going to be safe and how they can protect themselves they can look you can look on the dea.gov website for an incomplete list of the labs they think that they being the dea and other government agencies that for every one lab they find there are 10 they're not finding and the ones that you'll find documented on the dea.gov website and other environmental um, property review reviews that you can buy those are only ones that have been officially declared meth labs so like the one that i found in severna park not on this list because the police didn't declare it a meth lab because they didn't actually find uh, any precursors there was no person to find the bank was the house was bank owned and there was nothing for them to do no one to prosecute so it didn't go on the list so that's part of why people doing their due diligence and getting to know the neighborhood and the house and is so important here's a basement with some um, some precursors down in the left hand side you can see some of those um, Sudafed uh, or I'm sorry some some type of ephedrine cold medicine allergy medicine and you may see these tubes which are used to get they the moisture goes through these and it's you'll also see the bottles with tubes going from one to another so that some part of it like the detritus stays in one side and the useful part goes into the other side so you may have the two bottles in the one pot um thing you've also got to have some some something ventilating the area pulling that stuff out you may also see a lot of um glass jars and bowls i mean here's a great cooking area this bathroom lots of glass containers and and if you saw this on um breaking bad the main character walter white was a chemistry teacher at a high school and took glass containers from school and used them to make meth it's that's what you need red or yellow staining the red stained coffee filters those all those containers and just a ton of trash so much trash also weird things done to um to plumbing and corrosion and blue nozzles on the propane tank that you might see there because they use this for ammonia and the ammonia is really corrosive and so these propane tanks that have been exposed to ammonia are also there's a chance that they could just explode so look at them when you're getting a refilled propane tank you're you know wherever you are getting that to start grilling um, look at that and make sure there's no corrosion when you're in a house and you're like this there's something weird about this house i can't figure it out so you're like racking up the clues in your head as you walk through and then you see this that's another clue seeing this in the backyard just the dead area and we see that a lot so it's not like you would say i don't know that's clearly they were cooking meth but if you took that in conjunction with that in conjunction with this and this is what you may they may have ended up with if they'd left it like that's that is the leftovers from a, a meth lab that exploded 
Here are some other red flags. If anyone does rental inspections, they may see houses that look like this in the upper left-hand corner, just mess, just messes. Um, city rental inspections, we see that a lot. And it's not, if that's the only clue that you have, it's not, not good by itself. But if you put it in conjunction with these, then you might be thinking about it. And these are at the bottom on the left. Those are the, um, the one pot or um, shake and bake and stained carpeting. We've all seen the stained wood and stained carpeting. Not always a meth problem. Here's a house that someone was cooking in the bathroom. The bathroom's the best place to cook if you're not gonna do it in the kitchen because there's a, there's a source of water and there's a place to dump stuff out. You've got those five to seven pounds of toxic waste. What are you gonna do with them? You can't dump them in the backyard every time. Yes, that's damaging for the plumbing as well. And yes, this is in sync and Richard Marks and the posters over here. Just in case you're my age, just about 50, you, uh, you recognize that? This is an old picture. Strange plumbing we talked about. You've got to have, they're dumping the toxic waste down. They've got to have a way to do it. So they're looking for any place to do that. Here's some more shake and bake, one pot meth. This is the stuff that when, when you saw it called honey or peanut butter at the beginning, this is kind of where the name came from. This is the leftovers from cooking meth. And they are, here's another one. If, if you look on YouTube, there are videos of them stopping recording as the first spark ignites in, while they're cooking meth in a um, soda bottle. It's just remarkable. These people are high as a kite and, and they're playing with chemicals. Just so, so scary. If you think you found a clandestine drug lab, <coughs> excuse me, um, get out of there. Just leave. Get across the street, get in your car, lock the doors, call the police. If you've been inside and so you've found a, several things that go together, call the police and go outside and well, we'll, we'll let you know later what you have to do. Like if, there, if we end up having to, there's a decontamination process because I'm gonna let you know next week or next month. Um, it's what I've been telling you, just to get away. The occupants may be dangerous. The chemicals may be dangerous. The people may be dangerous. Always gotta take pictures of yourself. Um, so for the decontamination process, really, it's, a, it's I'm gonna kind of go through this quickly because every area has its own rules. The United States uh, EPA came up with a recommended plan for cleanup. It's like 300 pages, 200 pages. You can print it out and see it. Every state does not have its own rules. Like Kansas has its own rules, but Maryland doesn't. So you need to find a company that does this work and knows how to do it. Get rid of all the, the materials for making meth. So this wouldn't probably be you. This would be hazmat cleanup people. They're getting all the porous materials, all of the chemicals, everything that was used for meth, making meth, and then do a dry clean. Use a micro vacuum to vacuum all the walls, vacuum everything, and then wet clean whatever's still there and rinse it and then test. But you've got to test. I don't have test on here as the first thing. But you need to test to know what's there. And that and replace and it's cleaning out the ductwork it's everything has to be cleaned and it just depends on what the levels are of meth that are in the house that you have to deal with what the cleanup will have to be um and you can't i i already told you this too you can't know if there were drug labs they're based just solely on the third party envir environmental reports or looking at the dea I'm going to show you really quickly. Let me have like four, four or five more minutes, maybe less. This is going to be fast, but I just want to show it to you. Um, I get a lot of questions about this from agents too, and that is marijuana grow houses. Um, the inspectors that I've talked to in Colorado have had clients more concerned about mold since uh, the legalization of marijuana 
there. So I'm assuming that as it, marijuana legalization just spreads, more people are going to be more concerned about mold and more people will take it upon themselves to grow their own crops in the house. So in this, at this house, these are reflectors on the front, in the front yard. So reflectors for the lights that are hanging down over the plants. This is what marijuana looks like. So if you find a bunch of these in a house, that's what you're looking at. There's nothing to worry about. It's not the residue of, of this that you're looking at that you're concerned about. What you're concerned about is the moisture that it brings into the house. Some plants require up to a liter of water a day. And you know in a house that's lined with drywall, it was not meant to be wet. That's why we have greenhouses outside. So that's, this is what you're looking at. These are joints. These are, um, this is a, one way to smoke marijuana. That's marijuana. These are bongs. These are pipes for smoking marijuana. I had an agent say, oh my gosh, there was the most beautiful vase in this house when I walked in, but it smelled so bad. They didn't dump out the water. It was awful. And there was like a, a 20 year old guy in the class, a realtor. And he was like, I bet it was bong water. Can I please use my phone and look up what, if that's what this was? She pulled, he pulled up a picture of a bong and she looked at it. So that's why that's in here is because there are people who just don't know what they're seeing. So it doesn't matter to you. We see this stuff all the time. This stuff you may not see, which is the growing of it in the house. The reflectors are at the top. That number of plants is going to require a huge amount of ventilation. And there's going to be really, could be really high levels of humidity. Good um, growers will have it taken care of so that they don't um, lose a crop due to moisture because they have to burn it. If it's, if it's all moldy, they can't use it, can't sell it. Um, Here's some more. You may find in a basement that a room is lined with um, tin foil, aluminum foil. It may be because they're growing stuff. The big thing to watch for that with this is the ventilation. If you see evidence of it, you're looking for ventilation and you're looking for um, electrical irregularities because they may have been stealing the electrical supply from the neighbors because they don't want to have to call the um, they don't want to have to BG, they don't want to draw BGE's attention. You just did a house, Neil, awesome, just did a house a few months back. They couldn't get the smell of the plants out of the home. They re removed the carpet and repainted, et cetera. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Pretty pervasive. Um, just a question was it in Howard County, Neil? Let me know that. So the last one that I did was in Howard County, and I could smell the mold from the end of the driveway. And it wasn't a super long driveway, but it held at least three cars long. So I parked on the street and walked up. I could smell it. Carroll County. Okay. And they've had some meth uh, issues there also in the Mount Airy part of Carroll County. Thank you. Um, uh, and Neil is a wealth of knowledge, too, in the Maryland home inspection world. Um, he's got a lot of experience and satisfied clients. So... Um, now we know also that there's a smell to deal with, not the residue from the, from it being smoked, but there's a there's the smell. There's also the mold that exists after the plants are removed, and those that is an issue. So a mold mitigation company called me and asked me to come in and test, and I went in and I mean clearly there was mold. It was pushing the wallpaper off the walls. Everything was covered in it. Even the fan ceiling fans were bowing down from the level of moisture that had been there, and the floorboards were warped. It was pretty remarkable. I went back and inspected it three or four years later for a buyer and they had a photo album of it all. It's pretty neat. Just more mold um, and some interesting ventilation. You've got to get this stuff, some of this stuff out of the house. And you might have money and weapons. Leave it there, call the police, get away from it. And I just like this picture, so I put it in because I think it's fun. This is somewhere in Europe. You can see where they were growing meth, or I mean growing pot, marijuana. They're growing it up here in, um, in the attic, the one place where it's warm. Um, oh, and you found a bong in the bathroom behind the toilet. I don't think there is a protocol for calling someone about that, but with the child, by itself, but with the child being there, it may be that you call call Child Protective Services. You may also 
do a little investigating into the situation, if they're the seller or if it's a tenant or, and I'm reading, um, I don't know. What's the general consensus on that on contacting contacting people? I've found I've found those and what I did on the the last one, it was a rental and I was just doing a rental inspection for the the property manager. And so I let them know that I was concerned that, that there was drug use there and it was it was marijuana, but I let them know that there I was concerned because there was drug use there and there were small children. And they had taken all the batteries out of all the smoke detectors. So that was that was my first step, and I haven't heard back from her. That one was re relatively recently. So just I just like this mold picture. Protect your protect your clients, protect yourself. And these these are more for your agents. Just remind them to check on their vacant houses. Don't rent to people who only take ca pay in cash, and will rent sight unseen. Even in really busy markets, when people are buying houses um, or renting houses, they still want to see something of the house. And Alvin found a really nice fancy bong in a rental today. This is just a fantastic place to be. Where are you, Alvin? If everyone could put their name in their in their, their where they're from in the um, with their name on the renaming part of their stuff, that would be awesome. So then we could see where you're from. Um, Alvin, you're in Iowa. Awesome. And I am from Wisconsin, so uh, I feel some Midwest-ish connection. So thank you very much. And that is it. Tried to get it in, and I, I know I talked really fast. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. How did you get into this? I have been... The, the, there is no good answer. Uh, my, I mean, it, it really, because we're being in business with my dad, people were like, does it bother you at all that your daughter is so into this? Well, I don't know how I got started, but I remember every video that they showed, you know, in fifth grade to keep you off drugs and all the videos that I have been researching and fascinated by drugs, drug use, drug manufacture, and what what it takes for someone in their life to get to that to get to the point that they actually are need this like you're not doing drugs because you are so happy your life is wonderful and everything's perfect there's something missing for you and so i've been fascinated and then you know how you speak what you create you create what you speak and think about all the time i married someone who was an addict and i didn't know so then i was able to do even more research he is now sober and a an addictions counselor but I have there is no good answer other than I could research it, study it, read about it, talk about it for for days. This is radon and my kids. And my dogs. Thank you. An intern actually has a class that is that is gives some some information also. And I don't know about other classes that are that are out there. 